Let's talk about phase diagrams. So this is chapter 10 from the textbook. To unlock the full potential of steel, we have to understand heat treatment. Steel has different properties depending on the temperature it's at, the composition of the metal, and its history. So the heating and cooling that it's gone through. To understand this history part, we have to know what the steel, what the structure is at the given time. We're gonna call this a phase. So steel has phases, just like water can be a solid, a liquid, or a gas. The only difference with steel is that we have more phases than it can be. So steel has different properties depending on the composition, temperature, and history. The most important elements in steel are the amount of carbon and the temperature the steel is at. Now, there are alloys of steel that have all sorts of other ingredients, but carbon by far has the most impact on the most important properties like strength and ductility. What a phase diagram does is map and predict the structures the steel has during heating and during cooling. Phases can be a mixture or a solution. So a mixture is when two things are mixed together and they can be separated out, so cereal and milk. A solution is two substances that are mixed together where they cannot be easily separated, so sugar and water or coffee. Before we dive in to the iron carbon phase diagram, let's talk about the water salt phase diagram. So everybody knows when you have an icy road, if you throw just regular old table salt on it, the ice melts. But the ice doesn't melt like if you blow a propane torch on it, right? It's not really melting in that way. It's lowering the freezing temperature of the water. So that water is the same temperature as the ice. It's just in a different phase. Instead of being a solid phase with the crystalline structure, it's gonna be a liquid phase with an amorphous structure. So the two axes of this chart are the temperature, which matters, and the amount of salt. If we know those two things, we know exactly what phase that water is gonna be in. Is it gonna be liquid? Is it gonna be an uh, in-between phase? So partially liquid, partially frozen? Or is it gonna be a solid block of ice? It could also be, if you add enough salt in it, almost entirely salt and liquid water. At some point, the salt becomes su super saturated and there's no water to soak it up anymore. And that uh, raises the freezing temperature as well. So let's take a peek at the water salt phase diagram. From left to right, I have the percentage of salt. So at 0% salt, we know we have 100% water. That is represented by the vertical axis, which is the temperature. So we know at 32 degrees, water freezes. Above 32 degrees, water is liquid. As we add salt, we can draw a line from that 32 degrees going down. So if we just look at one point, I'll pick an arbitrary, say we have 10% salt right here. If we follow this line up, we could follow it back over here and say 20 degrees. Right? We've lowered the freezing temperature of the water. It's gonna remain a liquid at 20 degrees instead of 32. So we can just follow this line all the way down until something special happens. At some point, this line will start going back up. This is called the eutectoid point. We have another line at negative 7.6 degrees that's gonna intersect that eutectoid point and go straight across. Anything below this line is always gonna be a solid. Anything in this area, in this area, can be what's called the slushy phase. So it's part liquid, 
part solid. Anything above this, this bent line is going to be liquid. This line right here is called our upper transformation temperature. This line straight across is our lower transformation temperature. These areas in between are known as a transfer temperature zone. So we're gonna get a mix of phases. Let's chat about the phases of iron. Pure iron can be either ferrite, which is what it always is gonna be at room temperature with a body-centered cubic cell structure. If you elevate the temperature to about 1700 degrees, it's gonna change phases. But unlike water, this phase change isn't visible to the naked eye. If you're just looking at the iron, it's just gonna be red hot, right? It's just gonna be glowing. But inside of that iron, the atoms are rearranging themselves to form what's called austenite with a face-centered cubic structure. So this takes some energy. If you measure it, you'll see the temperature go up, it'll flatline while it's making that change, and then the temperature will start going up again because that phase change does take energy, just like water freezing or any other uh, phase change. At about 2,500 degrees, it's gonna make another change. And believe it or not, it's gonna go from austenite back to the body-centered cubic cell structure. This is called delta iron. Now, this is probably about the last time I'll mention delta iron because it's not really useful for heat treating. After it passes through the delta iron phase at about 2,800 degrees for pure iron, it's going to melt and you'll have liquid iron up until about 5,200 degrees when it, believe it or not, turns into a gas. The iron will vaporize. What we're really concerned with is the area from room temperature up to about 2,500 degrees. This is the austenite phase of pure iron. This is what we're gonna need for heat treatment. If you look at an iron carbon diagram, just like water and salt, toward the top, you'll notice that as you add carbon, you lower the freezing temperature of the iron. So the more carbon that's in it, the lower the melting temperature of that iron is. So pure, like wrought iron, requires more heat to melt it than does a, a steel with 1% carbon in it. It'll melt fast. This goes all the way down to cast irons, which melt at a much lower temperature than a steel or a wrought iron. It's one of the reasons cast iron is a little bit easier for casting operations because it melts at a couple hundred degrees lower than steel or wrought iron. So what's the difference between wrought iron, steel, and cast iron? The main difference is just the amount of carbon in the material. So anything from less than a percentage point carbon is gonna be wrought iron or pure iron. Anything between you know, 0.1% carbon to 2.14% carbon will be considered a steel. But most of the commercial steels have less than 1% carbon in them. Anything above 2.1% carbon is considered a cast iron up until about 6.67% in which the carbon can't be dissolved anymore. This whole range is useful, but for what we care about for right now, is gonna be the area between zero and 2.14. Cast iron is like a whole different thing. Cast iron, the composition isn't just temperature and carbon. A silicon has a huge effect on cast iron, as well as a couple other ingredients that can make really big changes. Steel is a little bit easier. So for the most part in textbooks, including yours, you'll see a little corner, the lower left-hand corner of the iron carbon diagram zoomed in, and then everything else will be out of there. So you won't see the delta phase. You won't see all the cast iron. There's just a couple lines that we're concerned with in the iron carbon diagram. So let's take a look at an iron carbon 
diagram. Visually, it's going to be similar to the water salt diagram, where the salt is carbon and the water is the iron. Straight across, we have our lower transformation temperature. This line represents our upper transformation temperature. Our austenite is our face-centered cubic form of iron. Our ferrite is our body-centered cubic form of iron. When we have very little to no carbon, the iron is ferrite almost all the way. But as we start to add in carbon, we're gonna get a mix of ferrite and austenite. But when you see steel, it typically comes in designations like 1020, 1080, 1010, 1018. The last two numbers are the percentage carbon. So a 1020 steel is 0.2% carbon. It would fall somewhere about here, right? So as we follow the temperature going up, we know when it hits the lower transformation temperature, we know when it's ferrite plus austenite, and when we know when it makes a full transformation to austenite. Now this is important for heat treating because we have to know when it makes this phase transformation. As we add more carbon, so we get to the 10, we're gonna get to a point which just happens to be 0.77% carbon, where we'll raise up our temperature and we'll hit the austenite without going through this middle phase. This is known as the eutectoid point. This typically results in a desirable steel known as perlite. It's a mix of ferrite and cementite. Cementite is just a steel that has a lot of carbon in it. So if you're heat treating steel with this much carbon in it, you know exactly what temperature you need it to get to to have that phase transformation happen. And then you can bring it back down to temperature as at the speed you need to acquire the type of steel you want. As we start adding more carbon, it's gonna take more heat to make that phase transformation. After we get past 1% carbon, where you get into more exotic types of tool steels. Essentially, the more carbon you have, the stronger and more brittle the steel is. So something like a high-speed tool steel might be over here in this one to 2% range. Most commercial steels are less than 1%.